Thank you for joining us in person on this rainy Nairobi morning. And because we have guests from within the country and outside the country, we are delighted that you brought the rain with you. This is, I think, the first IP event that we're having after the pandemic in person. So it's really a privilege and an honor to have you join us here today. We find that as librarians today, our roles have changed. Initially, we were just custodians of the physical print knowledge, but we have to change from that. We are now trying to train our users. How best can you access this online information resource that is available? How can you assess its relevance in your area of research? And how can you utilize that, that particular information without uh, infringing the rights of the creators? We have also become knowledge navigators. We have actually also gone ahead to become research data managers. Research advancement today now requires that as a researcher, once you have done the research, you have to keep the data set. And we have created through CLISC again, a lot of research, institutional research repositories and databases in our various institutions. And as librarians, we have to know how to, re to manage the research data and research uh, publications and materials created by our researchers. People are unable to afford to buy materials. You may find certain books are very expensive that the universities may not be able to afford to buy the kind of copies that are required. Copyright exceptions appear hardly adequate and effective to enable educators access knowledge and transfer or disseminate information. Most of it now we are realizing, especially in the wake of COVID-19, uh, the pandemic, most institutions were forced to teach online and it became problematic for quite a number to adopt and teach online. Quite a number of lecturers were not, um, they were, they were not flexible to post their material online, their teaching material, and accessibility to libraries became a challenge at the time. Students could not access books, and uh, many universities, I, I speak from the university perspective, uh, were, may, may have not had enough online material to enable the students' research. And, uh, respond to the lectures that they were having. So that essentially saw lecturers then caused to post material online and that is where most of the problem is. Now you'll find copying, the word copying, is an essential part of university education in Kenya. What remains uncertain is whether the copying takes place in fair dealing or not. The challenges related to copyright. So from the survey, these are some of the challenges and that, that figure shows us the challenges that 36.3% experience some uncertainty not knowing what to do, 30.0% limited permission, and then uh, prohibitive costs also stood at 18.8. So the figure there represents the challenges. How they overcome, they do good preparation. You, you prepare your lesson well, you get the materials uh, ready for the lesson. They also said they download and photocopy uh, before using. And then the use of digital cameras to take photographs and adaptations. And so when you're talking about photocopying, digital cameras, you know the implications of this. I am here in my capacity as a researcher. And to give you a little bit of an introduction to the video that will be played in our few, I am here representing the story of Masahane. And Masahane is in fact a grassroots organization whose mission is to strengthen and spur natural language processing. We can use AI to, to build language tools to bridge the gap. It would be great if educational material was easily translatable from 
English to you know another local language or uh, medical information and those are gaps that um, we can fill. The particular data set we used is one known as JW300 and it was created or curated from texts that are published by an organization known as Jehovah's Witness. Their data set was a very rich resource in availability or inclusion of African languages. We were able to connect to young people across the continent. It was easy for them to plug in because all they needed to do was select the language they wanted to train a model for. We published loads of papers. We managed to train very many machine translation models and this work has been widely successful in Research Circle. Um, subsequently, beyond that, comes the not so great stuff. At the time, Jehovah's Witness, if you looked at the website, they really laid it out that they do not allow text data mining. It was clear that we don't want you to do this. So that means we would have to rely on the exception. So the best thing to do was to write to Jehovah's Witness and say, hey, this is what we're doing. Jehovah's Witness declined. Like, you know, you become very concerned about the uncertainty that this places towards research uh, within there just because now you don't have it uh, a clear especially even like a single market where you even know across the continent not just south africa how do we handle kind of such such situations the reason we use human rights laws rules and discourse is to give us a tool to challenge inequalities you will find in Article 19 the right to freedom of expression, which includes the right to receive and impart information in whatever form. And isn't that what researchers do? And you will find in that Universal Declaration the right to education, which is another vehicle for receiving and impart information we heard from teachers this morning. And you will find in that Universal Declaration the right to share in scientific advancement and to benefit from culture. And isn't that also a right to receive and impart information? So exceptions and limitations. The purpose of this more or less is to strike like a balance of the interest of the authors, interest of users, and the public at large. The exceptions allow for use by third parties without the need of permission and also without the possibility of copyright infringement. So the general benefit that copyright exceptions are important is that it improves information access to generate knowledge. And knowledge essentially affects economic, cultural, physical, mental, and social human development as well as they enable information to be accessed to a wider audience through controlled reproduction. So therefore, both writers and publishers start to benefit from exceptions in their official capacity as users of information and also as receivers. So from the educators and librarians' perspectives, it would be extremely difficult for like an academic library to offer information services without some form of reproduction like photocopying. Exceptions increase the use of information services and supports research needs of users and enhances education. So this is particularly useful to libraries in developing countries where countries are seeking to widen access to tertiary and higher education through e-learning. Now in the digital era, we're getting more and more content uh, subject to licenses. And that's a good thing, right? Because the licenses, you know, we have access to more content than we ever did before. Uh, but unfortunately, the licenses often include terms that purport to limit the copyright exceptions. And the Jehovah's Witness example from before is a perfect example of that. But you just think of almost any license, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, an Apple iTunes license or uh, Netflix or any content uh, when a library uh, participates in a consortium, there's always licenses and the license terms uh, contain provisions that typically limit what you can do with that work that you're licensing. Since 1991, 
the EU directives uh, related to copyright have contained clauses that require the nullification of license terms that are, uh, that, that are overriding specific exceptions that are mandated by those directions. In the EU, they sort of recognize what is the point of granting an exception if a licensor can simply unilaterally override it. When you think about a library, libraries in the United States now, large research libraries, they're 80% of their acquisition budget is spent on licenses. So they're licensing far more than they're buying in terms of, you know, they're, buy, they're licensing electronic content much more than they're buying physical content. And if you, again, you just think about you yourself personally in terms of how you're getting content now as opposed to 10 years ago, as opposed to 20 years ago, right? You're, you know, in all of our lives, we're getting more and more of our content digitally subject to licenses that are often limiting those exceptions. What do we mean by scientific research? I mean, in the international literature, that word scientific is actually very broad. We don't mean only biology and chemistry or whatever. We basically mean the quest for knowledge. But one could maybe define that. So in the United States, for instance, we don't say scientific research. It just says research. It's a more general term. This term scientific research is old. It comes out of very old copyright laws, and it's not the way we use the terms today. So one could clear that up. One could define research to expressly include text and data mining, computational research, etc. Contracts. Remember the story today that Jehovah's Witness attached some contract onto their, onto their data set and said, well, you can use it, but you can't use it for text and data mining. Well, so now, even though your law says you can, the license says you can't, who wins? And it's not clear under the current Kenya Act, but some laws around the country have made that clear. They've said, no, if it's a user right, you can't override it by contract. So we don't care what the Jehovah's Witness puts on their webpage. You can use it because the copyright law says you can use it. So that could be clarified. And then finally, you know, one could shift a little more towards the U.S. environment and include that word such as to open those purposes to be more flexible over time. Okay. To give us a local perspective is uh, Chebet Koros. The Kenyan copyright uh, framework could permit text and data mining research. As Sean had presented on before, we are in the green. So that means that our law is pretty open. However, this law needs to be interpreted appropriately, guidelines need to be made, and also it needs to be updated. We have proposed a couple of amendments. One is to expand the existing narrow fair dealing framework. One is to shift to the fair dealing or fair use as South Africa is doing. And in this one we say that under section 26, if we can add the word such as, we'll be able to have a much broader law. And then if we can have the definition of fair scientific research in the law, that will help in ensuring that there is no ambiguity in what exactly am I doing that is fair or what is scientific research. And then we also see that if possible, we can have a specific exception for research. And then we have one of the issues that we saw with uh, the survey was that there's a lack of awareness. So we recommend that Kekobo assists in giving out guidelines on how the existing exception that we have as is can be applied to digital research such as text and data mining. The general limitations that we have are found in the second schedule and you can see that uh, one of them refers to the doing of any of those acts by way of fair dealing for the purposes of scientific research, private use, criticism or review, or the reporting of current events. So you see that the act provides for uh, the doing of those acts by way of fair dealing. But as, as has been mentioned by the previous uh, panelists or by the previous speakers, the word fair is not defined, or the word fair dealing is not defined. But as you can see, the, 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 the way it is it is scooched. It is an exhaustive list. The other exceptions that we have are with regard to educational institutions, and this is very important because it is in our education sector that we really need to have these uh, copyright works, you know, made accessible 
to the learners or to the people who are who are in need of this knowledge. So you find that the o Copyright Act provides that the inclusion in a collection of a literary or musical work of not more than one page from the work in question, if the collection is designed for use in a school or any university, and then it goes on and on. So you find that it's also very limiting. It says only not more than one page. And then we have the other exceptions with regard to libraries and archives. And we find that it provides that where the reproduction is in the public interest and there is no revenue that is derived therefrom. And then it also goes on to say that the making of not more than one copy of a book, including a pamphlet, sheet music, and all that. So it is also restrictive. It is specifying how much can be copied. It's only not more than one copy, uh, not more than one copy of a book that can be, uh, it's allowed to be reproduced. And then it goes on to say that uh, it has to be under the direction of the person in charge of the public library or the the archives for purposes of archiving or preserving where such book is not available in Kenya. There are some uh, major changes that we are proposing. As I said, we are, we are including a definition of fair dealing. Uh, we are also proposing to have a definition of, of research as opposed to just as opposed to scientific research. We are proposing to have a definition of just the word research, which is going to be you know, more inclusive as opposed to the way it is right now where that definition is not provided. And then we are also proposing to have, as I said, the use of phrases such as, such as, and including. The question that we are asking is, uh, and this is what I said at the beginning, which way do we want to go? What are we looking at? Whose interests are we looking at at this point? When you look at the, the situation in Kenya right now, uh, with the introduction of CBC and the grade seven classes being the pioneer classes in this uh, new educational curriculum that we have in Kenya, and we heard of reports at the beginning of the year where children had no books in school completely. They went to school and they had one teacher and they had no books because they are not accessible. The, the books are just not available to them because they're in public schools and something happened and the books are not available. So w w what if a book is photocopied, 100 copies, and they're all given to read? Think about that. Thank you. In the current times, there has been a rise of AI-generated work. And I think the major question to be asked is, who actually owns to copyright? Will it be the person who developed the algorithm or the person who input the instructions to the algorithms? And once the, we have established the owner of the copyright, who can be sued and under what or what procedures are being taken to establish the copyright owners of such works? In the US, the answer would be no one. If it's, if it's a purely AI generated work, like if you ask chatbot a question, that text that the chatbot puts out is not copyright protected. And you can think back towards the justifications of that a little bit. So copyright is intended to provide an incentive for creative output, but these chatbots don't need any incentive for creative output. They're just outputting it. So we don't provide any protection for the output of AI protected works. Now, if you use AI as a tool to create your own work, but the work is really your production, you're adding to it, and you're using it as a tool, just like you use Google search as a tool, whatever, then you are the owner of the content that you produce using AI as a tool in order to create your own content. I mean, that, that would be the answer in the US. There are several steps before uh, a work, for instance, a painting, is churned out by an AI-assisted uh, machine or, or robot or whatever it is. And so you have to understand the players along the whole value chain and what they own in the whole value chain. For instance, if we start with the, the software developer, the one who develops the software, he owns copyright in the code. Uh, and then uh, we go to the, the, the data sets. Who owns the data sets? Who owns copyright in the data sets? If they are photographs, who owns the copyright? It's the photographer. And then you go to the, to, the, to the other part of the person who now buys the machine and then uses it. Um, pro probably he's the one who plays the play, the play button and then the, the work is churned out. What does he own? And what, does he do what has he done for him to, to, to qualify as a copyright holder? So there are many uh, nitty gritties that you need to look at to arrive at the conclusion that this work is owned by so-and-so. And I know the U.S. courts have pronounced themselves on this, 
Uh, Kenya, I've not seen a decision from the courts yet on this. I just wanted to add that um, in the Kenyan copyright law, an author has to be a person or a legal, a legal body. So an AI is not a person. It's not a legal body. So it cannot own copyright. You also asked a question about can the AI be sued? No, because in Kenya as well in the law, only an individual person or a legal body can be sued. So take away from this session, exceptions and limitations are not blanket license for you to go out and copy uh, everything. They are guardrails um, that sort of guide what you can or cannot do.